Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to the service this morning. I'm Pastor Bob. It is great to have you here. Um, I hope you paid attention to the announcements because I'm not going to highlight anything other than uh, it's really good to see you. And we're trying to find volunteers to staff some of our hospitality ministries and our nursery and kind of ramp back up. And as you're comfortable, we would love to take your gifts and put you to work. So you could email us or contact us and that'd be great. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Jesus, thank you for your word. It's truth. Take away everything. It's just Bob. But this morning, would you speak to us? Would you minister to our hearts through communion? Would you renew us and restore us? And then, Father, as we turn our praise and worship to you, would it be pleasing? And would we leave the church scattered into our community and our world? making a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in a series in 2 Corinthians, uh, and it's called Press But Not Crushed, and it runs from uh, chapter 3-ish into chapter 6, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of a history if you haven't been with us or uh, this is new, and we'll just kind of pick you up to speed and we'll dive in where we're at. Paul went to Corinth to plant a church, and he started in the synagogue, and his message wasn't well received. In fact, uh, they kind of called him out and said, who are you? And he, and he uh, looked for other people. It was, it was a very, very interesting city. He found some Gentiles. They let him start a host church, and God showed up, and the thing just started to grow like crazy. He spent a year and a half there uh, training and planning and growing. It was an amazing thing. As he leaves, there is uh, some struggles that come in. Uh, False teachers, people coming along, things springing up. And and of course, you think people would drag all of their spiritual experience and background into this. And he writes the book of 1 Corinthians, correcting all kinds of issues that have come up in the church. In fact, as we find him at the beginning of our... uh, our passage where we started the series, he was struggling, uh, just waiting while, to hear what was going to happen. Are they going to repent? Are they going to turn from their ways? What's going what's to go on? He's pleading with them. And there's this good news that comes that they've been repentant and they've, they've, they've turned from some of those things and there's growth coming. And while they're still facing difficult times and facing challenges, we find in this section From a loving, caring father filled with emotion, he gives us 12 things that we have as they face growth and going ahead. It felt very fitting to us as we come out of one season and into another season and we're all trying to reorient our lives that that we could pick pick these 12 things and begin to go, uh, we want to grow like crazy. We want to take and employ these things, these, these things that keep us on course, these gifts and so you can go back and see. It's all on the websites on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm not going to rehash all of them so far, but last week Chris talked about we have this treasure. And th- these three weeks that we have here really run into one section, and so uh, I just wanted to remind you. Paul was talking about the treasure of having the very living Spirit of God in us, the glory of God in us. And you remember talking about we have this glory that's, that, that even... It never fades, and and the wonder of that. But we have it in pretty fragile, unimpressive vessels. Now, some of you think I just insulted you. (laughs) I kind of did in my own way. It was fun for me. Um, He calls it jars of clay, right? And all of us know we live in a broken world, and we talked about how clay is something that didn't really withstand, right? It wouldn't be the, the vessel you would choose for the most valuable thing. And he says, because of what's inside, because of this treasure that you have, you're going to find yourself afflicted, but not crushed. That should be. Shouldn't be able to stand up to that. And as you've read through Paul and all that happened to him, you, you you would go, oh yeah, like how did this happen? And he says, this treasure that's within this broken or failing body of mine in jars of clay is so powerful and so important he says we are afflicted not crushed we were perplexed but not driven to despair ever have that question god what are you doing what's going on i can't make any sense of this everything seems a little sideways and off and i'm perplexed how does this fit 
in a loving God's plan for me. But it's that spirit of God, no despair. We're persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. The living spirit of God within us, sustaining us in and through all things. So as we come to our passage, I want to talk a little bit because we're going to talk about faith and belief today. And, and Paul makes these statements that I think we should all just grab onto because we have a faith and, and there's something about believing it and speaking it that's so important. Have you ever noticed the connection between affliction and trouble and your belief structure? You know how they're connected, right? I mean, it's easy in my life, and you don't have to put your hand up. At home, you can. Your wife knows anyways, or whoever's with you. Um, but when you, pray, when you face affliction, and when you face trials, and when you face some, some things that just don't, they're perplexing and don't make sense, isn't that great breeding ground for doubt? What's going on? Does God really love me? Does he really have this? Is he really able? I mean, we have this preset connection, and I don't know if it just came from our generation or our world, where we would tie this idea of hardship or difficulty or it not turning out the way we imagined with God being displeased with us or us enduring some kind of punishment. And really, those two things aren't connected in Scripture like that. Yes, he lovingly disciplines his children, but he also said in this life there will be trouble, and we'll see in Paul's life that his call was filled with, this is what's going to happen, bud. And then we have an enemy that's out there, right? The father of all lies, the master of all destruction. What does he want to do? He wants to prevent you from fully believing, from trusting, from walking in faith. And so he whispers those things to you. I don't know if God's going to meet this need. If he really loved you, why would you be in this situation? He's just trying to prevent you from experiencing something. Maybe you should just grab the reins. And so do you see where I'm coming from? Where there's a, a real connection between your belief and your faith and, and, and some affliction that you face. And when we talk about belief, it's not something that we conjure up and we just like, yeah. Right? You know, it, it always makes you, I'm going to be a star. You ever hear that? And you kind of laugh and go, but you're talentless. I don't know how that's going to work. If I believe it enough, it'll happen. Hmm, maybe not. Is it, I can believe that I'm skinny, but I'm just not. <laughs> Belief. Confidently trusting beyond my circumstances. I mean, Hebrews talks about it, right? It talks about faith. What does it look like when you allow the truth to shine into your struggles? And you get down to that bedrock that is God. Where you declare trust in the face of difficulty, not knowing exactly how that's going to turn out. As you watch your children fight to find their way. As you face a job challenge and a change. As you... What does it look like to have a Holy Spirit-enabled faith and trust in God? So we get to our passage today. Right after he talks about jars of clay and this incredible treasure, uh, we come to chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. It's on the screen, or you can look it up on your device. Some of you get off of Facebook, go back to your Bible app. And uh, here we go. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and, I, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also. For it is all for your sake, so that his grace extends to more, and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. He starts with this, we have this same spirit. Now, this is a quote from Psalm 116. And the psalmist in 116, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just blow through this. I'm going to paraphrase it. And you can go look at it later and pull it out and figure it out. 
But he's been working through some turmoil and difficulty. I mean, at one point he says this, I'm greatly afflicted, and if I read it correctly, he's worried about his very survival. So he's in the midst of a struggle, in the midst of a trial, he's under affliction, and then he gets to this place where he declares something. So I went through it, and here's what I see him declaring. A confidence in God that he's able. And then he declares this, I will walk with God among the living. What he basically says is, uh, I, I like what Peter said when People were leaving Jesus, and Jesus looked at them and said, uh, so, uh, Peter, are you going to leave me too? And he said, where would I go? I've seen too much. And the psalmist says, my decision is to walk with God in spite of my circumstances. I declare confidence in God. I declare a walk with God among the living. He declares this assurance that there will be eternity, and he will be with God. And then he talks about the result in his life when he does this that he becomes filled with hope for the future. There's a renewal of his vows before God, this recommitment of himself to walking with God. And then it talks about him making sacrifices. And if you want to look at a modern-day equivalent, it's like uh, worshiping God and giving thanksgiving. And so Paul is referring to something that these people would know and get and, and would understand, and he brings them back. And he says, since we have the same spirit of faith, We believe, so we speak. Now this is, how many of you are affected by how people talk? I am, okay? And if somebody uh, is aggressive, I'm defensive, right? And if somebody uses uh, a lot of, we were with a bunch of Christian workers on a field setting And they used all of these abbreviations that we didn't know. And I feel like this around our pilots sometimes. They talk in a lingo that none of us understand. Uh, We have a game. We just make up stuff. We, We have great conversations about what they're talking about. But how people speak affects us. And, 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 And how they communicate in emotion comes across. And how we speak often reflects what's in our hearts. Right? You meet someone that's anxious and they use certain terms and they communicate certain things. Someone that's angry. You can tell pretty quick. I mean, just touch on a hot button issue right now and watch the response of people and listen to what they say, right? And so what's in our hearts and all that seems to come out when we speak. And Paul's saying, we're going to do something. We're going to proclaim what we believe and the bible talks about the power of the tongue and the power of words and i'm not going to take today to to pull that apart but if you want to do a cool study just do a study through what the bible has to say about your tongue and your words and the expression of yourself how important it is in your worship and how dangerous it is unchecked it's incredibly powerful And so when you put this all together and know that we will proclaim what we believe, uh, there's two ways that I watch people right now proclaim things. Self-talk. Sit and talk to people and I'm not worthy. I'm disqualified. I could never. You're such a dummy. See, Satan loves that self-talk, right? God must not love you the same. It's not available to you like it is to everybody else. Those are lies. That's self-talk. And if you begin to proclaim what you believe, you've got to be careful what your self-talk says. It reveals who you believe you are in Christ. And if you believe that you're still a sinner, you're still broken, if you don't believe that you've been forgiven, that you're a child of God, that you're sitting at the table, it's a problem. He says, the same spirit of faith is in us that was in you. It's going to start with believing this is who you are in Christ. And then it's going to come to this power of proclaiming what we believe in a proclamation to others. Because when we start proclaiming to others, you know what it reveals? What we value 
and what we trust. I mean, talk to somebody about the economy, about inflation. It will begin to reveal something that's going on in the heart. Paul says, this language in Psalm 116, I'm going to use it. They believed and so they spoke. And you see the psalmist doing it and says, we also have that spirit. We believe and so we speak. And it's going to reveal all of that. And then look at where he lands and starts with the speaking. The resurrection of Christ is the basis for this belief and confidence. Right? Right? Like, he just starts at this really, really critical moment, this, this, the place where it all happens. He says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us, to, bring us with you into his presence. Look at what he's speaking or declaring. God who had the power to raise Jesus... Jesus, who's living, who's ruling, who's reigning, and who's returning for his church and his bride. Jesus, who by his resurrection shows that the payment for sin was accepted, that sin was atoned for, that God made a way to secure eternity, and that relationship between man and God could exist. That you could stand right before God just as if you'd never sinned. That payment on the cross in your account. And when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that that happened and that was for you. And you say, come in. That treasure is in you, the living spirit of God. And he says, the belief that we're going to speak, we're going to start with the resurrection. We know who raised Jesus and he had the power to do it. He's revealed his will and his work in the world. He will raise us together. He's able to, as promised, it will happen and bring us into his presence. You know what that does when you speak the truth, when you identify with that truth? And in a few minutes, we're going to have communion and we're going to say, yeah, that was for me. It changes your whole perspective. And then Paul says, it's all for your sake. Verse 15, for it's all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Ran across this story, a fisherman named Sakamoto, a Japanese farmer. He lived in a small hut on top of a hill behind a little fishing village in the bay. He was known and loved by the whole village, and he would often climb the hill, and people would, or people would often climb the hill to talk to him because his house was on the hill. One day, the water in the bay suddenly retreated, and fish were flopping in the mud. The people were excited and came running to pick up the fish and to put them in baskets, but up on the hilltop. Sakamoto saw what had happened, and he was alarmed. He'd seen this happen once before as a child, and he knew that an earthquake had caused it, and that soon a tidal wave would return, and he had no time to run down the hill and to save the people and to stop them. So what he did is he turned and he set his house on fire. And when the people who were gathering fish saw it, they ran up the hill to save his home. And when they got there, he was just watching it burn, and he told them, Never mind, turn and look at the bay. And as they looked, they saw a tidal wave come in, and it destroyed the whole village in a moment. They lost all, but their lives were saved by the old man's sacrifice. Jesus did the same for us. He saw that we would be swept into hell by the forces of evil, but he gave us the hill of Calvary to look to and to flee in order to escape those forces. And instead, we have the right to enter the kingdom of God. May God help us see beyond the visible and gain the values he wants us to have by seeing the invisible. Paul, in the commissioning in Acts, was told, you will endure hardship. You'll be beaten. Things are going to be hard. Like, who's going to sign up for this job? And yet, if you go back and look at his commissioning, uh, he knows this is what's coming. 
And he was sent by God and empowered to go. And at one point says, if I lost it all, if I could give my salvation away and go as a sacrifice for everybody, I would do it. That's how badly he wanted to people, see people saved. Setting the house on fire was no big deal. The things that he had to go through were just things that he was called and commissioned. And then he's clear that as you encounter the resurrection and you encounter the resurrected Christ, that this isn't something where now you're saved and you climb behind your, your nice little fence and you, you come into your church and you've got your little group of friends and it's, oh, this feels so good. Now how do we build up some big walls against the world? In fact, it says that you're part of the call and commission, that the Holy Spirit gifts you and equips you. And then they start talking about you as agents of reconciliation, helping other people find reconciliation with the Almighty God. How he's commissioned you out into the world and he's given you job places and neighbors and friends and, and he's given you opportunity after opportunity to what? Believe and speak the truth, not only to yourself, but in the situations he's placed you in. The call to believe and to speak is important. And this was never meant to be an end unto, unto itself with your comfort and safety. It's meant for us to gather with all the other believers for eternity. And so Paul says there's clear results when this happens. When we start to do this, it says... When we just put ourselves aside and embrace this call and commissioning of God in our lives and we, we do what Jesus calls us to and we consider others as more important than ourselves, it says that grace extends to more and more people. Now, the Bible is so clear that salvation, your sins being atoned for, paid for, relationship with God being restored, is by grace alone. You can't obey enough rules. You can't get yourself into a place where you've done it, balanced the scales, done enough good to take away the bad, right? It is a gift of God. And when he pulls the curtain back and shows you how much he loves you and what he did for you, your response, you accept that by grace, salvation by grace through faith. I believe, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. Jesus is Lord, I accept that. That's salvation. He says, oh, that that grace would go to all kinds of people. That undeserved, unmerited favor of God through you as agents. Where you get to speak it, you get to see it, you get to participate in it. He says, when this happens, that grace goes out more and more. And then something really cool happens. Gratitude is expressed. That there's this understanding, and it says, it may increase in thanksgiving. The people begin to worship a God who would do this for them. Their focus comes off of their momentary afflictions and troubles. We'll get into that next week. Their focus comes off of the different things that are pressing in on this amazing treasure, and it turns up to God. And there's this increase in this generous participation with God, and God gets the glory. Let me read this statement from someone, and we'll ask a big question. Uh, I didn't credit their name because... I wrote it on top piece of paper. I typed it in and threw the paper away, and I forget who it's from. But if you know, give them the credit. It's not mine. It says, ultimately, the devil wants you to be quiet. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to shame you into silence. Either that or he wants you to join the caffeine of complaining and anger that we are experiencing in our world. Instead of being filled with forgiveness and joy and hope in Jesus, but when you buck the trend, when you speak up about your hope in Christ, God is glorified and it is infectious. More and more people give thanks. Then we aren't discouraged when we are attacked or ridiculed for what we believe, but a part of that is that we need to speak up. Keep focused on the resurrection. It will change how you talk. It is a hope that gives a different perspective. So that's a big question. So what? so what? There we go. How do we walk out of here and anything be different? First, I'm going to encourage you this morning to lift up your eyes. Now, the psalm says, 
to where my help comes from. Whatever it is you're gazing at today, you can leave it at the foot of the cross. Whatever you carried in here, you can leave with him. Oh, would you see a God who loves you and did this for you as you participate in communion? Would your focus go back to the resurrection and the core of our belief? As you're quiet and you prepare for communion this morning, I'll ask a couple of questions. Has your affliction, the troubles, the way life is pressing in, the things that you face, the disappointments, has it resulted in despair where my focus is on the problem and not on the God that resides within me? Has affliction in your life resulted in doubts? Could I really trust God with this? I don't know if I have the resources to face it. Or perhaps this morning your affliction has resulted in sinful behavior. God wasn't delivering fast enough for you met your needs your way and just took it in your own hands. Good news today, if that's your case. See that cross? <laughs> covers everything. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin, to cleanse you from all around. You could leave it here today. Repent, ask for his empowerment to go forward. Secondly, I want to challenge you in the so what to speak what you believe. So reflect, ask the Holy Spirit to tell you, how are you speaking to yourself? Are you lawyering up? Are you, when you feel that gentle nudge of the Spirit, the conviction, are you, you coming up with all the reasons why you're right and God's wrong? Or you shouldn't have to, or I don't want to, or don't touch that. How are you speaking to yourself when it comes to who you are in Christ and how you stand before him? And then how are you speaking to others? Are you careful with your conversations? Are people leaving your presence feeling, man, there's something different about that guy, that girl, that friend. Every time I leave, I feel the love of God and I desire more. One thing I'm going to offer you here in just a minute is a practical response. I'm going to offer you an opportunity to praise. And the band's going to lead us in three songs where you can, between you and God, speak those words. Speak them to yourself. Speak them in your heart. Identify with these glorious truths about who God is. And then as you join your voices with other people, what happens? We reinforce that. We together proclaim. And God is glorified and he's honored with our worship and our praise. But remember to check your speech. It matters. So the third so what is we're going to renew the resurrection truth. Hopefully you got one of these when you came in. If you didn't run to the door, there's some there. Uh, my apologies for this little piece of styrofoam or whatever it is in here. Uh, surely we can do better. And somebody said, I don't think we can do worse. And that's a challenge we're not going to accept. But let me just tell you real quickly, this is, uh, this is not an alliance deal, okay? This is not our church deal. This is something Jesus gave to his followers. And he's with, the, with them in the upper room, and he institutes something for them to remember. And, and it's going to make a whole lot more sense afterwards, right? And they're going to remember the cross. They're going to remember that God loved them and sent his son into the world not to condemn the world already stood guilty, but to save them. And Jesus willingly went to a cross and laid his life down for your sin and for mine to provide a way for this right relationship with God to exist in our hearts. And so it says uh, he took the bread and you peel a little top part of it and take this piece of styrofoam that represents the bread. <laughs> And he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. This is how much I love you. But this is the cost of sin. This is what it cost. 
to do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I love that a covenant is a living thing. It has benefits and drawbacks. Remember when your mom used to get mad at you for making this much noise in church? <laughs> I do. Yeah. Living covenant. We serve a risen living Savior. He said, do this in remembrance of me as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember the Lord's death until he returns for his church for us. Let's partake together. Father God, would your spirit renew in us a wonder at the resurrection. Remind us that that's the basis for our belief. Would your Holy Spirit today speak to us in ways that we've been speaking to self that's not right? Ways that we've been lawyering up that you just want us to leave at the cross and take away. Ways that we've been engaged with others. And Lord, would we have the same spirit that we believe and our belief is based on what you have done and who you are and thus we speak and we are agents of yours in the world. Amen. Last so what? Look beyond yourself. So many of you uh, struggle with this, as do I. Do you realize that God puts you here, whether you like Cold Lake or not? <laughs> or wherever it is he put you. You're called and commissioned. It's not an accident you are where you are. If you're just putting in time and passing, you know, <laughs> get involved. God's got something for you to be a part of. And you can pray and you can ask God to open a door. And, and you can begin to know your God story and begin to just be able to talk about, man, I don't know lots of these things you're asking me. This much I do know. That God has touched my life. Let me tell you my God story. And let me tell you who God is. And then let me introduce him to you to him so that you can have your God story. And then how are you doing at expressing thanks? As you turn and remember, as you refocus, as you pick your eyes up. How is your expression of thanksgiving? Are you renewing your commitment to him? Are you offering your time, your talents, your gifts like this with open arms? Or are you hoarding and hanging on, worried that God doesn't have enough? Remember, as you respond, as he does amazing things, the glory goes to him. Stand and sing with us.